Welcome to today's Hidden History, Stories from the Secret City. I'm Ray Smith, and Keith McDaniel will not be with us today. He's got some sickness in his home, but I'm glad that we have Todd Ryder with us again today. Uh, he's going to talk to us about the nuclear uh, weapons and other weapons, I think, in the, in the German arsenal back during World War II. His book, Forgotten Creators, is a wealth of information about that and other things. But I'm glad to have Todd with us today. And oh, by the way, we've agreed that we're going to do a follow-up session at, for our next Hidden Histories to put a wrap on the series that uh, Todd has been bringing us with this information. So Todd, take it away and tell us what you've got planned for us today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me back. <clears throat> and uh, before we start, let me just point out uh, that uh, as with my previous presentations, uh, what I'm presenting is not only my own work, but the work of a lot of people who've worked for many years in archives around the world. Uh, and that absolutely everything I'm gonna talk about, everything in my book is drawn purely from unclassified sources. Uh, so with that out of the way, I'd like to talk about the nuclear triad. And the nuclear triad is usually defined as the methods of delivering nuclear weapons, uh, either by land-launched missiles or sub-launched missiles or intercontinental jet bombers. And uh, for the last 75 years, we've thought of the nuclear triad as something that was developed uh, post-war after World War II by the US and Soviet Union as part of the Cold War. And I'm going to show evidence uh, that indicates that actually the nuclear triad was developed, or at least under development, uh, in Germany during World War II, uh, and furthermore, that the components of the nuclear triad, the technologies, were then transferred to the U.S. and other countries after the war. Uh, so we'll cover that, the different aspects of the nuclear triad. Uh, in this presentation, I'll only talk about the land-launched missiles. Uh, if there's enough box office to warrant a sequel, uh, then we'll come back and we'll talk about sub-launched missiles and the jet bombers in some future presentation. Uh, so uh, previously on the Nerd and High Castle, we had talked about the nuclear weapons programs in Germany during the war. Uh, there is evidence that they were developing at least three types of nuclear weapons. Uh, there was a small one, which was uh, a mass of probably around 300 kilograms or so, and had a yield probably less than a kiloton, uh, and was developed for uh, tactical battlefield applications. Uh, there's evidence that this uh, project was highly advanced, uh, possibly finished and tested by the end of the war. Uh, then there was the regular sized one with a mass of about two metric tons, a yield if deployed of probably tens of kilotons, uh, and it does appear to have been successfully tested during the war. And then there was the super supersized version, uh, which was six tons with a yield probably in the megaton range, uh, this would have been a full-fledged H-bomb, uh, quite advanced for its time, uh, and uh, there's no evidence it was tested during the war, but the uh, sources uh, involved in this say that there were plans to test it if the war continued, uh, to test it later in 1945 or at the latest 1946. So this would have been in a very advanced stage of development. <clears throat> now, surveys have shown uh, that nine out of 10 mad scientists prefer to have both a nuclear weapon and some method to deliver their nuclear weapon. Uh, and so if Germany was developing nuclear weapons, it stands to reason they also were developing methods to deliver these nuclear weapons to allied targets. And that's where the nuclear triad delivery systems come in. So we'll talk uh, today just about the land-launched intercontinental missiles. Uh, and those came in various flavors. Let's start off with liquid propellant missiles. The one that everybody is most familiar with is the V-2 rocket, uh, also called the A-4. The German rocket engineers had a whole A series, different A members of rockets that they were developing. Uh, so I'll generally use that A-4 nomenclature. Uh, but once it was used in the war, it was known as the Vengeance Weapon 2 or V-2. Uh, and V-2 became something of a generic name. So just like we might use the word Kleenex to refer to any sort of tissues or Xerox to refer to any sort of photocopy, uh, V2 uh, could be used in a generic sense in some of these documents to refer to any kind of large German rocket. Um, so the uh, standard A4 
uh, had a length of 14 meters, nearly 50 feet tall. It's quite impressive if you're standing next to one of these things. Um, its standard payload was one ton, one metric ton. Uh, the launch mass was about 14 tons. Thrust was about 27 tons. It had a range of 300 kilometers uh, so it could get over the English Channel. Uh, it was first flown successfully uh, in October 1942, uh, so over two and a half years before the end of the war, uh, first successful flight, and they built over 6,000 of these during the war. So it's a very impressive uh, rocket. Uh, it's also very well documented in all the history books. What people are less familiar with, but what you can actually find in the history books if you dig hard enough, um, is a variant of this called the A4B or the A9. Essentially, they added wings to it. And with the wings, uh, once it had exhausted its propellant, that could keep on gliding and glide to its target. And so it had an extended range. That was the idea anyway. Uh, otherwise, the specifications were very similar between the uh, A4B and the A4. Uh, so according to the official history books, they built about 10 of these. They launched two of them. Neither of those launches was fully successful. And then the program ended. And I will show you some evidence to indicate this may have gone beyond that, beyond just these couple of unmanned uh, A9 or A4B launches. Uh, there are other variations. Officially, nothing else other than those two I just showed you was built, but there's some evidence that there were other interesting things that were built. Um, and so an author named Philip Henschel was digging through the British National Archives and came across blueprints for A4 rockets that have been modified such that they had a central chamber here that was hollow. And so here, Henschel has redrawn it, uh, showing the central chamber in the rocket. Uh, now, the drawings don't explain what they intended to put in this chamber, but it was clearly not propellant. Uh, it was something else. Uh, and his theory and mine was they intended to put a warhead here. Uh, as I mentioned, the mid-sized German nuclear warhead uh, had a mass of two tons. The standard A4 was designed for a payload of one ton. Um, so if you are you know, loading up a small boat and distributing weight around, and at the very last moment, somebody gives you an oversized, very heavy thing to put on the boat, you could put the very heavy thing on one end of the boat and then rearrange everything else, but that's a lot of work. It's much easier if you put the very heavy last minute addition in the center of the boat. And I think that's what they were doing here. They're trying to put uh, the oversized warhead uh, near the center of mass, center of gravity for the rocket. <clears throat> Uh, then there are other variations on the A4 that may have been built during the war. Um, one straightforward thing to do would be simply to make it longer. Uh, and uh, so after the war, uh, the uh, Soviets uh, captured a lot of German rocket engineers and technology. Uh, they built more A4s, which they called the R1 or the SS1 in the Soviet arsenal. But they also built extended A4s. So the standard A4 was 14 meters long. The Soviets also built 18 meter and 21 meter versions uh, called the SS2 and SS3 uh, respectively. Uh, and over in the US, uh, Von Brown and his buddies uh, were also building uh, 21 meter long V2s, except they called them the Redstone or the Jupiter C. Uh, but so a 21 meter long uh, V2 or A4 uh, basically. Uh, and it's possible that the German engineers in the United States were having teleconferences with the German engineers in the Soviet Union during the Cold War, but it seems quite unlikely to me. So I think probably both of these German teams were basing their post-war work on wartime programs uh, that had developed or been trying to develop uh, extended length uh, stretch limo versions of the A4. Uh, and uh, I'll show you some evidence of this shortly. <clears throat> uh, now we come to an interesting uh, part of the story that ties some of these elements together. Uh, this was a photo of some of the lead German rocket engineers being congratulated at their base at Pinamunda uh, in 1942 after the first successful test flight of the A4. And so in a black suit back here, looking suitably proud and ominous, this is Werner von Braun, uh, this is his immediate boss, Walter Dornberger. Uh, but this person here is Heinz Stolzl. So he clearly existed. He was clearly important. 
uh, and yet he has almost vanished from the history books. You will not find him in many of the history books now. Uh, but here he is in this photo. <clears throat> and apparently shortly after this, in 1942, um, he was dispatched from Pinamunda uh, to a different rocket base, an underground facility in Thuringia in the middle of Germany. And we know this because we have uh, some of his mail. Uh, this is left over from his estate after he died. Um, so he was receiving mail at Erfurt. And one might think that he was at Nordhausen. Nordhausen, uh, Middle Baldora, is the very large, well-known underground rocket facility in Thuringia. Uh, but this is someplace else. This seems to be a different facility where he was. Uh, so he was doing very interesting, very mysterious work in the later years of the war. And then after the war, all the other German rocket experts uh, were captured and went to work in the United States or Soviet Union or the United Kingdom or France. Uh, Stolzl, on the other hand, headed for the hills. He hid out in Switzerland. Um, they, they didn't work for any of the allied governments. And he was free to say anything he wanted and to write up anything he wanted. And so here after the war, August 1945, he was making these blueprints that seem to be related to his wartime work. And these blueprints show an A9 or an A4B with wings, uh, but with some peculiar features. This thing is 18 meters long instead of the usual 14. So it is the stretch limo version, but it's also piloted. In fact, it has two pilots here, highly, highly unusual. So two pilots here, uh, and one might think, well, maybe these are just the sci-fi speculations of an unemployed rocket scientist after the war. Uh, but then in digging through the US National Archives at College Park, I found some other documents. So these are from just before the end of the war when uh, US uh, Army forces were invading, taking over Thuringia, exactly where Stolzl had been stationed. Um, and so these are memos written here in the final month of the war in real time uh, as the US uh, is coming into this area. Uh, and they describe a massive underground factory uh, at a location. Again, this is not Nordhausen. These coordinates do not match Nordhausen, but they do line up when where Stolzl was employed. Uh, factory employs 20 to 30,000 people, foreign workers, including a lot of French. They are making the V4 which is a two-man rocket of some sort. And this other note from the same incident says gadget holds two men. So it's designed to launch two men exactly like we saw in Stolzl's drawing. Uh, partial assembly, it's being mass produced at this factory and then partial assembly here. And then it's being sent to Weimar to another factory uh, for final assembly with other components. More information later after complete interrogation. Uh, and uh, so this was 8th of April, 1945, 10 days later uh, in the Paris newspapers, articles start showing up. Again, a lot of the workers here had been French. They'd been freed when the Americans came along. Um, and so 10 days later, some of them have gotten back to Paris. They told their story. And this describes exactly the same thing, a massive underground factory uh, employing thousands of French and other foreign workers. Uh, building the V4 uh, super rocket. Um, and then finally, uh, here is a memo I found in Air Force archives. Uh, and this is from June 1945, just before this whole area was handed over to Soviet control uh, during the Cold War. Um, and says, yes, indeed, there is a large underground rocket factory right at this location, uh, but no further information on it. So of course, there would have been further information. There would have been detailed site inspection reports. There would have been detailed interrogations as they you know, say here, they will conduct. They would have had interrogations of these workers, of German scientists. Um, and yet none of that information has been released, uh, at least as far as I'm aware. So where are all of these reports? But this actually appears to be real. And let's stop and think about the implications of this for a moment. And we're talking about during the war, so early 1940s, the Germans are producing rockets designed to launch two people into space. Uh, and they've not merely designed them, they've built them. And they've not merely built them, they're mass producing them at a facility with 20 to 30,000 workers 
And that's not the only facility. There's another facility at Weimar that they're also working with, possibly others. So there's a large German industry mass producing rockets to launch two people at a time into space. Uh, this is something that would not happen again until the 1960s in the space race. Uh, so this is fully two decades ahead of its time. It's amazing work, and most of it has never been released to the public before. The A9 could be launched by itself, uh, or it could be launched on top of a booster called the A10, a larger rocket. Uh, and uh, with the A10 boost, the A9 would have enough range to go all the way from Europe uh, to the United States. Uh, and um, officially, the A10 was just a paper drawing. Officially, it was never built. Read all the history books, that's exactly what they say. Uh, but I will show you some interesting evidence that may indicate otherwise. Uh, there was an even larger rocket. Uh, so after the war, when Brown came to work in the United States, uh, he was chatting up some reporters in December 1946, and he said, oh yeah, during the war we were developing this rocket that would deliver a six-ton payload to the United States uh, across the Atlantic. Now, even the A9A10 could not deliver a six-ton payload. Its maximum was one to two tons. So this would be a different rocket. Von Brown clearly had a specific design in mind, something specific he was working on. He doesn't say what it was. Uh, the best match I'm aware of would be something called the A11, even larger than an A10. But he clearly desperately wanted to deliver a six-ton bomb to the United States. And we know from other documents that Germany was developing a six-ton hydrogen bomb. Uh, then there were other large rockets as well. Uh, these are being developed uh, in Bohemia, uh, in uh, the Czech Republic, what's well, now the Czech Republic. Uh, and uh, so from Time Magazine, November 1945, says retreating Germans uh, left behind uh, fuselages, fins, and other parts of V-bombs. In safes, uh, there were plans for the V-4, said to be a giant radio-controlled rocket capable of being fired from Prague to the Americas. And they also left lots of uh, nuclear components as well, suggesting they intended to develop a nuclear warhead. Uh, from the same time, 1946, uh, this is a report from US intelligence uh, after having visited this facility. And uh, this Czech facility uh, fell under Soviet control. So it was very difficult uh, for a US observer to go visit, but he actually managed to get in and visit and said, uh, yes, they had completed the V4. Uh, he saw the completed V-4 rocket at this facility in Bohemia. He talked to the German scientists who'd been involved in developing it and were now going to turn it over to the Russians. Um, and he tried to talk to them more, but he was prohibited by the security services. Uh, here is another post-war intelligence report uh, that uh, V-3 and V-4 models built during the war are presumed to still be there, including all data still at this Czech plant. Uh, a final report that at least one of the prototype V-4 rockets had been taken from Czech territory back to Russia. Um, and they'd taken the rocket, which had several features. It had considerably increased range over the A-4, this reports, uh, consistent with being able to go all the way from Prague to the Americas. Um, but it also says this nose had a new and more powerful charge. Uh, now, the, the standard A4 used conventional explosives. Uh, there's only so far you can go with those. So if you really want a new and more powerful charge, it suggests that the warhead may have been nuclear. Uh, Germans certainly had big plans for these rockets. Uh, this is another document from the estate of Hein Stolzel. Uh, in addition to drawing his rockets, he drew their planned trajectories. This shows the suborbital trajectory uh, and the atmospheric reentry trajectory uh, for his rockets. And from the Deutsches Museum archive, uh, here is a drawing showing exactly where they plan to land. So lower Manhattan right here uh, with the zone of damage all the way out to the rest of New York and parts of New Jersey here. Uh, so, uh, you know, clearly they had very specific ideas when you care enough to send the very best. 
Uh, so where the rockets actually built, uh, there's a lot of evidence from a lot of people in positions to know that these rockets were actually built. They all say they were built. They all say exactly the same thing. So German officials who are highly placed say that the large rockets were built. Um, here is Henry Picker, who liked to hang out with Hitler and copy down information from Hitler's uh, inner circle, inner conversations. And he says, up to early 1945, Hitler wanted the A-9 long range rocket intended against the USA to be ready for series production and completely operational. He hoped that the intercontinental rocket would make the US amenable to peace. And especially if he could have equipped it with the uranium bomb. Uh, this is from Otto Squazzini, a uh, highly placed commando, uh, again, like to chat up Hitler. Um, and he says that, you know, talk from Hitler and people around him uh, was about a terrible weapon that was supposed to be based on artificially produced radioactivity, so a nuclear bomb, uh, designed to be launched on a rocket. Included in the VU weapons program was the construction of a rocket capable of bombarding New York or Moscow. This rocket was practically finished at the end of March 1945. Prototypes were finished in March 1945 and could have gone into series production, mass production in July 1945 if the war continued. And this is from Werner Grotman, Heinrich Himmler, Himmler's adjutant. Uh, the giant rocket intended for America had just been built in Thuringia shortly before the end of the war. Uh, they were building prototypes for flight tests uh, and they were planning mass production. And once they had mass produced versions of these, then they planned to start launching them all at the United States in October 45. Uh, and uh, when the war ended before that, he reports that there were some hotheads, presumably meaning Hitler, uh, who wanted to go ahead and launch the prototype rockets with the prototype nuclear bombs. Uh, so all these folks are telling the same story. These large rockets were built. They were designed to be armed with nuclear weapons. Uh, but then, you know, clearly that did not happen before the end of the war. Uh, so it's a huge unanswered question. We just don't have the documents to answer exactly what happened, exactly how far they got. Uh, if they were stopped, you know, did they simply run out of time? Uh, did we send in George Pippard to stop them? Uh, just it's unclear exactly what happened, how far it got. Uh, from the Allied side here is supporting information. So wartime Allied intelligence. Uh, this is from early 1943, so over two years before the end of the war. Uh, and it says that investigation, Allied investigation, quickly disclosed uh, that there was a large group of German technicians in the German army uh, experimenting uh, with very large conventional types of rockets with a total weight in the neighborhood of 68 tons. Now, the standard A4 or V2 weighed only 14 tons. So this is much larger than a V2. Uh, and this US intelligence document says that it's not a paper design, they're experimenting with it in early 1943, uh, and that it's so clear from the evidence that they're experimenting with it, that allied investigation quickly disclosed this, no question about it, it's clear. They have these large rockets, they're experimenting with them even two years before the end of the war. Uh, here is another uh, Air Force document. This is an interrogation of a prisoner of war uh, who had seen some stuff before he was captured. Uh, so in 1944, he had visited an underground facility in Southern Germany in Friedrichshaven. And he reported that V2, using kind of the generic term here, V2 was being made there. And that the V2 was so large, it took three railroad cars to haul every V2 out of the factory. Now a standard V2 or A4, could be carried on one railroad car. So again, this is something much larger than a standard uh, rocket. And it was being mass produced at this underground factory in 1944, according to this Air Force intelligence. Uh, here is another document. This is from the beginning of 1945, January 1945. Uh, very high level briefing document uh, at the very top of the US Army Air Force uh, describing the present status of known German weapons. And they say that larger rockets, rockets larger than the A4 or V2, are known to exist 68 feet in length. So this is not at all the standard A4. Uh, so all these folks are telling exactly the same story. These large rockets were built. 
Uh, same thing goes for allied political leaders. Here's Winston Churchill just after uh, the war ended in Europe when the Americans captured vast stores of rockets of all kinds near Leipzig. Uh, once we had all the information and once we examined all the emplacements for launching them from France and Holland, uh, then it became clear uh, just how much peril there had been from all these. Uh, only just in time did the Allied armies blast the Viper in his nest, Winston Churchill being Winston Churchill. Uh, otherwise, the autumn of 1944, to say nothing in 1945, uh, might well have seen London as shattered as Berlin. So Churchill, from what he had seen, what had been reported to him, was certainly convinced of the reality of these things. Uh, this is U.S. Uh, Senator Thomas, um, and he is describing things he has seen uh, during his tours and have been reported to him. Um, about a dozen new few weapons were on drawing boards and in laboratories, much more than just paper documents, uh, and nearing production. One would carry people in a pressurized cabin. That's exactly what we've seen, the two-man rocket in a pressurized cabin. Another would be launched from a submarine. We'll talk more about those next time, uh, capable of crossing the Atlantic uh, to uh, deliver a weapon to New York. Uh, and it wasn't impractical. Germans' prediction was they were able to do this very soon. Rockets more deadly than the V-2 would have reached all important cities of England. We couldn't have prevented it. Just before VE Day, I personally visited a V weapons factory uh, so he saw all this stuff uh, with his own eyes, um, and he says that we were just in time. Uh, and here's Senator Harry Byrd, another U.S. Senator, reporting exactly the same thing. Uh, almost ready was a V-2, again in the generic sense, of a much greater range. Uh, I personally saw the progress they made on the Super V-2 type, rocket-powered, capable of crossing the Atlantic to New York. So this would be the full A-9, A-10. He says he saw this with his own eyes. It was nearly uh, ready. So everybody's telling exactly the same story, which disagrees with what is written in the history books, that this was purely a paper project. Uh, same thing from Allied military leaders. Here's General Karl Spatz. Uh, so December 1945, the Germans were readying a transatlantic model when the war ended. Uh, this is from uh, General Henry Arnold uh, in the Army Air Force. The A-10, a very large rocket intended especially for New York, was being built, not a paper model, being built. Uh, here is a, another document from NARA and says mass production of V-2, again in the generic sense, uh, capable of a range of 3,000 miles, was within reach of German scientists at the close of the war. Uh, and from Colonel Donald Putt, uh, Putt is quite an interesting figure. Uh, he was a colonel during the war. He became an Air Force general after the war. Uh, he was one of the main people charged with rounding up German scientists uh, at the end of the war and bringing them back to the United States and employing them and finding out everything that they knew. Uh, so we can take very seriously uh, information from Donald Putt. Um, so he says uh, here that, yes, the Germans were readying rocket surprises for the whole world in general and England in particular. Uh, much more than just the A-4 rocket. Uh, more information, uh, these rockets were intended to be armed with a nuclear warhead. Uh, so once the Allies were in France uh, in 1944, September, uh, they reported discovering evidence of uh, rockets uh, armed with a warhead with an explosive radius of three kilometers. So clearly something nuclear. Uh, this is uh, Colonel uh, George Woods, during the war, he was in Air Force Intelligence. After the war, he became assistant to the Undersecretary of the Air Force, so highly placed. Um, and uh, he wrote after the war that, oh yeah, everybody knew, at least all of his intelligence buddies knew, that Germany was developing the A-9 with an atomic bomb. Uh, it was well known that the Germans originally had hoped to have all this completed by the end of 1944. Uh, and uh, more information from Donald Putt, uh, here in the Army Air Force's official publication, uh, it is now fairly uh, well known that Germans were you know, building large rockets, trying to equip them with atomic bombs, and we still don't know exactly how close they came uh, before the end of the war. So all these people were not you know, just kind of speaking off the top of their heads, making stuff up. They're all saying exactly the same story, 
based on what they've seen on the ground and people they've talked to, there must be reports. And yet the official reports on this stuff have never been released. Where are those reports in archives? Uh, more information from allied military leaders. Uh, this is from the CHAOS committee. So the Combined Intelligence Objectives Subcommittee uh, was investigating all these German technologies. And this was a joint final report from the US and British heads of this very powerful Kaios committee, just summarizing some of their greatest hits, some of the most impressive things they've discovered. Uh, and they say, oh yeah, there was a latest model built of the A9, which was capable of a range of 2,400 miles, which would require the A10 booster to be with it. So the A10 booster was apparently built as well, at least according to this. Uh, and it's a fact that there were radio controlled models capable of an accuracy plus or minus 150 feet. Uh, so very, very accurate uh, compared to the much cruder uh, A4 uh, used earlier in the war, um, which had relatively poor accuracy. Uh, and this passage, experiments had already been conducted on piloted models. So you've seen the plans for the piloted model of the A9. Uh, you've seen the US Army's reports that the piloted models were being mass produced. Uh, these people, you know, after investigating it for a while after the war, these highly placed people are saying that experiments had been conducted on piloted models. Yeah, they launched the piloted models. Now, if you launch a piloted model without a pilot, it's not a piloted model. Uh, so they may have actually launched pilots with these things. Again, imagine this launching essentially astronauts in 1945, a couple of decades uh, before the space program that we know. Uh, and the same report says that, oh yes, they were intending to equip these rockets uh, with nuclear warheads. So this is just the summary final report. It mentions this, it mentions lots of other stuff. Uh, we have full reports on the other details mentioned in this summary report, uh, but we don't have any full Kios report uh, on these advanced rockets that are nuclear armed. So where are those reports in archives now? Uh, this is further uh, evidence. Uh, this is from uh, US Air Force General William Richardson. And after the war, he blabbed to the press and said, oh yeah, at the end of the war, they're developing these large rockets, nuclear armed, yeah. Uh, but again, where are the reports? Uh, in addition to the site visits, all those people seem to have visited sites and reporting what they'd seen with their own eyes, there'd be interrogation reports, uh, interrogations of the, the captive foreign workers like the French workers, but interrogations also the German experts developing this stuff. Um, and one of those would be Hans Kammler, who was the top SS general on all of these programs. Officially, he died in May 1945. Um, as I mentioned in one of our earlier programs, uh, here is a document showing that he was captured alive by the US and was still being interrogated as of six months after the war. So Kamler could have revealed a lot of details in his post-war interrogations uh, about these rocket programs, as well as the nuclear program. Uh, for example, here is a document that Kamler had signed off on during the war. These are train logs uh, recording shipments to and from Kamler. Uh, this is all very high priority material. A lot of it appears to be nuclear. Uh, but one of the line items here that Kamler signs off on uh, is the delivery of 18 meter machines, very high priority 18 meter machines. What machine would be 18 meters long, thin enough to go on a train, high priority and associated with nuclear stuff? Um, quite possibly one of these stretched limo versions uh, of an A4, one of these 18 meter A4s. But again, where are the reports? There would be extensive reports on the post-war interrogations of Kamler. Those have never been released. Uh, speaking of other interrogations, probably all of the German scientists involved in these programs would have been interrogated extensively after the war. Uh, we have virtually no uh, interrogation reports on them. In particular, we have almost nothing on von Braun, the guy who would have known the most. Uh, so here is von Braun with a group of other German rocket experts after they'd come to the US. Uh, this is the famous paperclip program. And all these people have a paperclip file uh, at the National Archives. So here's an index of the various paperclip files National Archives has, except Werner von Braun 
has no paperclip file. His brother, Magnus von Braun, has a paperclip file, and lots of other folks have one, but Werner von Braun does not have a paperclip file. Now, he was important enough that, of course, he would have had a paperclip file, just like everybody else. They didn't overlook him. Uh, so he must have a paperclip file. There must be all kinds of juicy stuff in that. Uh, and yet it's not been delivered to the National Archives. So where is that paperclip file? And why can't we read it? What is in it? Uh, here are other reports that we don't have. Uh, this is a cover letter from June 1946, year after the war, uh, written in the US Army Air Forces. Uh, it says that they've gotten two captured German rocket experts to write up a report about all the large size German rockets and applications. This is the cover letter, but the actual report that goes with the cover letter just happens to be missing. Nobody has seen this in the archive. So where is this report? Or here is a card catalog from the National Archives at College Park. Um, and it's a card catalog of reports that should be on file. Uh, and these are reports of large German rockets, in particular one here entitled The History of the German Transatlantic Rocket A-10. So if the A-10 was only a paper design, never got beyond a, a simple paper sketch, why was there a whole history? Why did somebody write up the entire history of it uh, why was that history written two years after the war by the Central Intelligence Group, the predecessor of the CIA? Why was it classified top secret? Why is it still classified secret and uh, unavailable to us, withheld from us? Um, and why is it filed with atomic energy, nuclear physics uses that suggests that this rocket was carrying a nuclear payload? So again, where are all these reports? We know that they exist. We can show that they exist. Why have they not been released? What do they contain? Uh, what we do know uh, is that there was a large transfer of all that technology to the US and to other countries. Uh, Savannah von Braun and all of his hundreds of buddies uh, formed the core of uh, US military and civilian uh, rocket and missile programs after the war, all the way up to the Saturn V. Uh, likewise, German experts uh, were central for the uh, Soviet-Russian uh, rocket programs. Uh, even the Soyuz that is flying now is directly based on designs, uh, overall designs, uh, from a team led by Helmut Guttrup uh, and with engines from a team led by Werner Baum. So it's all directly German-designed material. Uh, in the UK, they captured their own German rocket scientists put them to work, um, and uh, no moonraker happened. Uh, but uh, they did uh, develop their own rockets in the UK, at least until they got cheap and canceled the program. Uh, and the French uh, had a lot of captured uh, German scientists put them to work, uh, and that led all the way to the modern uh, Ariane uh, launch vehicle nowadays. So we can see the technology transfer process that happened uh, with this. Uh, so that's liquid propellant missiles and rockets. Let's talk about liquid propellant space planes, essentially space shuttles. Uh, the earliest one that we're aware of was called Zilberfogel or Silverbird. Uh, and it was designed as a suborbital bomber. Bomber. This was an active program that ran for at least 12 years before the war ended. Uh, it was headed uh, by the Austrian Eugen Zinger and his wife, Erna Brett. Uh, and they designed what is essentially a mini space shuttle. It had one pilot. It was designed to drop a bomb uh, on the city of your choice. And they did detailed calculations of their mini space shuttle and of suborbital trajectories for it, atmospheric reentry trajectories. Um, it was designed to be launched on a rocket sled. So to give it more velocity taking off, uh, it would go up a very long ramp, uh, a track uh, with a rocket powered sled. Uh, boosting the vehicle up to at least Mach 1 before it took off using its own engines. Um, and if you've seen old sci-fi movies like When Worlds Collide, uh, they'll show you this kind of thing. Uh, it's all based on uh, Zilberfogel. Uh, so officially, this was just a paper project, uh, but their paper project had some interesting parameters. They were specifically trying to deliver a six-ton payload to New York. What could that six-ton payload be? The German hydrogen bomb, weighed six tons. 
Um, according to the history books, this was never built, never got beyond paper, but there is some evidence that it did, in fact, uh, get built. Uh, so here is from uh, the uh, reliable Donald Putt, again, from the US Air Force. Again, he'd rounded up all kinds of German scientists and information, so he knew what he was talking about. Uh, and a year or two after the war ended, he said, oh yeah, a test model of the Zilbervogel was built, a prototype that carried one man and had landing gear. Uh, we actually don't know if they did a test flight of it. Maybe they did a test flight. Um, what we do know uh, is that uh, test runs were made with the engine. Uh, we know that the engine was built. This is a photo from the Deutsches Museum in Munich uh, showing construction of the Zilbervogel rocket engine, 100 ton thrust, very massive uh, rocket engine for its time being built in 1941. So four years before the end of the war, they would have had ample time to complete the rest of it. Uh, and here is a report from 1944, after the allies invaded France, they found that uh, Germans had been building very large uh, launch ramps for these things, just the sort of launch ramp I described um, that a Zilbervogel would need in order to take off. Um, and moreover, the German engineers had warned people when we launched this thing, uh, make sure you stay at least six miles away. So if things went wrong, if the bomb blew up as they were launching, then the bomb would have a blast radius of six miles or 10 kilometers. And that corresponds to the megaton range. So again, we're back to the German uh, H-bomb, the six ton bomb. So where are the reports on this? You know, We have these interesting uh, accounts in the popular press, we have this interesting photo. There must be detailed reports in archives, but where are they? Uh, and then after the war, this technology was transferred, just like the rockets. Uh, and uh, here were a couple of key people involved in the transfer. One was Walter Dornberger, uh, Werner von Braun's buddy from Panamunda. Uh, and so after the war, he designed and built all kinds of versions based on Zilbervogel, um, something called Bomi that was designed but not built. Uh, the X-15, of course, was built and used quite successfully. Uh, they built, uh, but then canceled before they launched it, the X-20 Dinosaur, which would have been the first U.S. space shuttle, canceled in 1963. Uh, here's Hans Moltop, uh, and uh, so he came to work for the United States after the war uh, and designed the X-24 lifting body. So if you've ever seen The Six Million Dollar Man, think about the opening of that show, uh, where they show uh, one of these things uh, trying to land. Um, and so uh, this was designed based on Zilbervogel. Then all those technologies were used in the US space shuttle proper. Uh, and uh, Jennifer and Brown started arguing for a space shuttle as early as 1952 in the United States. Uh, Walter Dornberger was the one who actually dubbed it the space shuttle. He gave the name. Uh, the space shuttle incorporated all the technologies that had been developed for these earlier programs, both in Germany uh, and German programs in the post-war United States, from Dinosaur and the A9 and so forth. Uh, another German scientist, Olaf Busemann, uh, was the one who proposed the ceramic tiles uh, for the thermal insulation to insulate the space shuttle on re-entry um, and proposed the, some of the specific shapes for it, aerodynamic shapes. Uh, Kraft Erike was another scientist deeply involved in all these post-war rocket plans based on his wartime work. The main engines of the space shuttle uh, came specifically from several uh, German uh, rocket engine uh, designers. Uh, and the solid rocket boosters on the sides used uh, solid propellant technology that had been uh, developed by German scientists, as we'll discuss next. Uh, so final bit here for today on the land launch missiles is solid propellant missiles as opposed to liquid propellants. And uh, of course, solid propellants for rockets go way back to ancient China. Uh, but during World War II, the Germans took those conventional solid propellants and pushed them as far as they could in developing things like one of the very first surface to air missiles, the Rheintochter here in 1943. Uh, and this four-stage solid propellant rocket, the Rhein Bote, also in 1943, uh, range of 200 kilometers. So very impressive technologies, but these were about the most that you could do with the conventional 
uh, pre-existing rocket propellants. So people needed better solid rocket propellants and German scientists developed that. Uh, nowadays, we call this newer type of propellant ammonium perchlorate composite propellant. Uh, during the war, the Germans called it perpulver, per for perchlorate and pulver means powder. Um, but this was fully modern uh, solid rocket propellant widely used in lots of rockets nowadays, uh, but developed uh, during the war, uh, in particular by Hermann Teichmann, uh, but also Rolf Engel, Uwe Budavant, uh, and Hermann Wüllers. Uh, and um, so they developed all the major features of these advanced solid propellant rockets. They demonstrated uh, that uh, these work in small uh, working uh, solid propellant rockets. They may have built larger ones. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and then after the war, they were captured and transferred this technology to other countries, um, including the United States. This mentions here interrogations by the United States of Dr. Teichmann. Uh, here is something that they were working on during the war that was much larger than a small test rocket. Uh, there are documents from these interrogations uh, reporting that they were working on what they called the V-101. And the V-101 used their new solid propellant, but it used it for a rocket with a total weight of 140 tons um, and uh, designed for a, a very long range of thousands of kilometers. So this would have been a solid propellant ICBM. Uh, and then after this, it just goes dark. It's not clear what further interrogations happened. It's not clear how far they got during the war. Uh, maybe it was only a paper design, uh, but there must be more information still buried in archives. Uh, we do know that that information was transferred though to the United States and other countries. Uh, and that information was transferred from experts like Dr. Teichmann here. Um, and it was transferred by other German speaking experts uh, like Fritz Zwicky. Uh, Zwicky uh, was Swiss. He'd worked in the German speaking research world for a while, uh, was educated there, uh, came to the US before the war and he ended up working for Caltech and the War Department and Aerojet Company as their research director. And all of these were involved uh, in wartime and post-war uh, production of solid propellant rockets in the United States. Uh, so here is a document saying that, oh yeah, Fritz Vicky is very eager to interrogate Hermann Teichmann to find out all the latest details about his solid propellants. So this seems to have been transferred to the US this way. The information was transferred Teichmann himself went to the French and was probably one of the main reasons that French rockets uh, were so advanced uh, after the war. Uh, but other uh, German and Austrian experts came to the US, in particular, uh, Karl Klager came to Aerojet, Fritz Vicky's company. Uh, and uh, Karl Klager was an expert on both solid and liquid propellant rockets. Uh, he's not famous, so you always hear about Werner von Braun, you don't hear about him. But if you start looking at patents, you'll see he was all over the place. So he was highly, highly integral uh, to these post-war rockets in the United States. Uh, so all that was German technology developed during the war, transferred uh, with German scientists, by German scientists to the United States after the war, uh, and then went in to the first large uh, U.S. Uh, solid propellant rockets after the war, like the U.S. Navy's Polaris, the Army's Pershing, uh, the Air Force Minuteman, uh, all these things used that technology. So we always think about liquid propellant rockets being developed and transferred by Vanner from Brown, um, and people in the history books will say, well, solids were developed by the United States by itself uh, after the war, but no, here we can see exactly uh, which Germans developed it and how it was all transferred. Uh, so I will end there on a cliffhanger unless the box office warrants a sequel. Uh, and uh, next time we'll talk about the other uh, two sides of the triad, the sub-launched missiles and the intercontinental jet bombers. Um, if anybody's interested or if anybody has trouble sleeping, uh, you can go to my website and download for free uh, my uh, book. It's nearly 5,000 pages, of which over 1,000 pages covers these German programs to develop uh, weapons of mass destruction um, and the vehicles to deliver them. Uh, in particular, if you're looking for the vehicles, uh, go to chapter nine on aerospace engineering for a shorter overview of some of the things I've described. Um, and then if you really can't sleep, uh, go to Appendix E 
uh, for about 800 pages or so of all the primary source doc ar archival documents that I've shown uh, on this. And again, it's all free on my website. Very so, good. Thank you, uh, Todd. Surely do appreciate that. And yes, we want to continue this theme and uh, we appreciate all of the research that you've done and the presentation you made today. Oh, thank you. All right. So, uh, folks, we will be back again. I think we're scheduled for the 24th uh, to do the next session, Todd. So if you'll plan on that for us, we'll continue this story at that time. Okay? All right. Thank you very much. Very good. Folks, thanks for joining us today. And I'm hopeful that Keith will be back with us on the next time and that the sickness that is home will be short-lived and everybody will be all right. Thanks for joining us, and until next time, Hidden Histories, the stories of the secret city.